All right, cool. Sorry, guys. So I'm a franchisee just like you guys at the moment. Um, so this is probably, this is my third time teaching a class. Um, so I'm still trying to get used to, you know, sitting up here and talking in front of everyone. There's a lot of you guys to talk to and I'm, what I'm going to try and do is I've got an hour and 15 minutes or so, I'm going to try and tell you my story and I'm going to try and change your expectations a little bit from what you're thinking gyms might be about or what you're going to go in and expect. So um, the reason I'm up here, um, I got a call from Jim asking to come in and help, help teach you guys about what I've done in my business. I've been able to get some pretty good results in the last three and a half years um, for my franchise. And so I'm hoping that some of you guys might be able to do something similar. Um, basically, um, show off the bat, first 12 months, the reason I'm here talking to you guys, I made over $300,000 in sales in my first 12 months. So I'm from the mowing division. Um, very, uh, mowing, obviously, you know, low, low source of sales, but a high volume. That's how I was able to make my money. So I'm here to explain to you how I've done that. Um, where I'm sitting now, three and a half years in, we're making over $600,000 a year. Uh, and that's without working for three and a half months because of COVID. So we could have done a hell of a lot more. Um, so what is it that I've done that made my business a bit more successful? And how can you guys put that into your own businesses? Well, first of all, it wasn't easy. It was actually very difficult. So I don't want anyone thinking that, you know, it's something that's very easy to do because it's not. I worked my bum off. Um, so I came in with the expectations that I was going to make around $2,000 a week um, mowing lawns. Um, and we had the $1,500 guarantee. Um, and so how that expectation came around was at the time I got told that I could make around $400 a day, work five days a week, get my two grand. Um, if you work your weekends, you'll be able to pick up $2,800. I'm not sure if you guys have similar expectations to that as well or not. Um, but basically, so I came into my first week and that didn't seem to be the case for me. So I went in and I worked seven days. Um, and instead of making 2,800, which I was expecting to make, I ended up making 3,650 for my first week. Um, not really knowing what I'm doing. I'm not an expert in anything. Um, and that's where I kind of started to get this idea of, okay, maybe I'm onto something here. Maybe this is more than what I was expecting. I'm gonna change my business plan. I'm gonna change my whole strategy. Um, so I worked seven days for that first week um, and I took on uh, all the leads I possibly could for that first week. Um, and I took on all, all types of once-off jobs and I said, all right, because I've made this much money in this first week, I'm just going to do exactly what I've done again the next week. And so I did that. And so I had my regulars and the idea was um, that what, you, what most people do and what my idea was, was I get my regulars and I sp split them out throughout the days and then I take on a bit of extra work here and there. What I decided to do was instead of me separating all my regulars and putting them all throughout the days so that I could get to my $400 a day limit, I decided, you know what, it doesn't matter. Why can't I just do them all at the start of the week? I'm still gonna be earning the same amount of money. Um, and so then I, what I was able to do there, I, I did them in the first two or three days. And then I was like, all right, now that I've got nothing to do essentially, it's time to build this business. So I started putting in little sales building ideas and techniques. So I started doing add-on sales for each of my regulars that I already had. Um, and I started taking on more leads and I started, there's a whole bunch of things that I, that I do. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but basically I was sitting there trying to figure out how I could move my business forward because I was so excited about what I did in my first week. I wanted to replicate that because I, I didn't want everyone to think it was a fluke. Um, so, um, Three and a half years in, we're doing some pretty good results right now. Um, I work seven days a week. Uh, for my first year, I think I had about eight days off. So, um, and that was the days that I needed off. So my wife wouldn't, didn't want me to work Christmas. Uh, <laughs> would have got in trouble. Um, Easter, had to take Easter off. Um, and my wife wanted me to go on a holiday throughout the middle of the year. And I also had a child in that first 12 months as well. So I took a day off for that as well. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, basically I just, I worked, I worked my bum off. So I'm, I'm not sitting here selling you guys the idea that it was easy because it definitely wasn't. And that's one of the things that I kind of questioned when I first came into this, because this is my first time owning a business. And my, one of my biggest questions was, is it easy or what's it like running a business? Is it hard? Is it easy? I had no idea. And so as I, as I moved along and as I started doing it for myself, I learned that... <coughs> 
running your own business is what you make it. If you want it to be easy, it can be easy, but you're not going to get the outcomes that you desire. Where if you make it hard and you work seven days a week, and if you work and you start at seven o'clock in the morning and you don't finish till five or six o'clock at night, um, and you're up doing your admin all hours of the night, it's going to be hard. It's, it's, not, it's definitely going to be hard, um, but you're going to get some really cool results and you're going to get the stuff that you want out of it. Um, look, for me, when I first came in, everything was like, I was in a pretty tight financial position at the time and I'd spent all our savings on this business. So I put everything into it and my wife pretty much said, you need to make this work, otherwise, you know, that's it. <laughs> so um, so I, I did everything I could possibly do to make it work. Um, and I learned that the more I put in, the more I got out because I was in control of this business that I now owned. So. Um, as I, as I said, I worked at 7 o'clock in the morning. I got up every single morning. I was up at 6 o'clock getting all my gear ready so I could be at that first job at 6.55 in the morning, ready to start up that brush cutter at 7 o'clock on the dot. Did I piss off some neighbours? Absolutely. Um, they, they eventually got used to it after a bit. Um, had a few, few little arguments and I learned not to do maybe that customer at 7 o'clock in the morning. I'll go to another one. Um, Basically, I was trying to make as much um, of the daylight as possible. So I was trying to do as many jobs in that daylight as I possibly could. Um, now, I was, I was all about the money at the start. I was all about you know, trying, to, trying to bring back my savings and trying to get um, ourselves into a position where we could afford to pay the mortgage and the bills and you know, the kids' schooling. Um, but now what I've learned, so that was my idea. Now what I've learned is because I did that, because I did that hard 12 months, um, my lifestyle now that... I have is a lot better than what it would have been if I decided to choose a lifestyle kind of, um, uh, run the business from a lifestyle point of perspective. So if I wanted to work three or four days or five days um, and not put in those hours, where I am now, my lifestyle is a lot better off. I'm only working five days a week right now. I'm not on the tools at all right now. I haven't been on the tools for about two years. Um, and all, I go out there and I quote and I've got a team of five guys and I just make sure that they're all running fine throughout their day and I make sure they've got all the equipment that's all up and running. Um, and I'm able to spend a, a lot of time with my two daughters and my wife and um, I'm able to help grow the business even more. But you know, it's, my lifestyle now is a lot better than what it ever would have been had I not done that at first 12 months. Um, so you've, I had, in my class, I had people that were divided and they said they joined because of lifestyle and people that joined because of money and jo people that joined because of both. I was definitely money, but it ended up that I decided that I wanted a bit more of a lifestyle as I went on after I made that money at the start. And look, we're, still, we're making a lot more money now, um, but it's a lot easier on me than what it was in that first 12 months. Um, so does anyone have any questions about that? So that's, that's kind of the, the basis of my story. I'm going to get into it a bit more. But um, does anyone have any ideas of uh, what their expectations were? Did you guys have ex similar expectations at all to, for what money you would make every week? Not really? 27 and 3? Yeah, what, what division are you from? Mowing. Mowing as well? Yep, absolutely. So I, as I said, I kind of want to raise the expectations a little bit. And I want to see, I would like to hear if any of you guys from this class do quite well, I'd like to hear about it. Because after this class is done, I don't really hear from anyone again. I'm out there running my own franchise, the same as you guys are. But I'd love to be able to hear it. So if my email's there. Um, if you can send it through, if you do become successful and if you do, you know, do quite a good job, I'd love to hear it. I don't know if it's going to happen from this one conversation. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, hopefully it might change something the way that you're thinking about the business. Um, but that's completely up to you guys. So if you're jotting it down and taking it all in, I definitely recommend it. Otherwise, we do have the video um, that you can watch later on on YouTube under Jim's training. <coughs> hey, Dan. Yep. Are you going to touch on employees versus splitting your business? Uh, your versus, sorry, I'm going to touch on employees, but what do you mean about splitting the business? Uh, you know how you can do a split? Yeah, absolutely. Sell, sell a bit off? I'm going to touch on my version of that and my opinion, um, yep. but ju just because it's my opinion, it might not be something that's right you guys might decide to run your business a completely different way. I'm not saying that my way that I run the business is right. I'm just saying this might help you towards how you want to run your business. Sorry, you had your hand up? Where do I look for good employees? Um, so <laughs> um, at the start, I was looking on Facebook and Seek and all those different places. Um, and then... Over the last three and a half years, what I've personally learned, in my opinion now, is that um, 
you ask your family and you ask your friends, and you ask your friends of friends and your friends of family and your family of friends, anything to do with that, your different friends will have a family member that needs a job or they'll have another friend that has another friend that needs a job. So that's how I find my employees and I tend to find better quality employees from using those sorts of lines. Rather than, I, I put out a, uh, a job application and I had over 50 people apply for it. I had to go around and call them all and do little trials with them, it took up a lot of time. And now at the end of it, I didn't get anyone that would fit my business and that would have the same care factor in my business as what I did or the employees that I have now. Because the employees that I have now, I, I previously knew or friends that I knew previously knew them, so they're always going to care about your business a little bit more. Um, so uh, if that gives you an idea, friends and family, it is for me, that's my opinion. Um, that's what I'm going to stick to. Um, it might work differently for you guys though. Um, so just because I'm saying friends and family doesn't mean it's going to be the same for you guys. You might, you might find a different way to do it. Um, so you said splits before. Um, yeah, splits versus employers. <coughs> yep, so... Um, a lot of people will, will, will uh, build up their business and they'll get to the point where they have 70 customers and then they want to build it up to 110 and then they say, oh, you know what, I can sell off 40 of these customers and I can get a bit of money for it and then I'll go back to 70 and build up again and then I'll do it again. And they kind of just stick around that 70, 80, whatever it is. Um, it, it might be a high number or a low, lower number depending on what lifestyle they want. I don't do that personally. Personally, I don't, I've never done a split and I don't plan to ever do a split. Um, for me, um, when you sell off splits, um, you usually sell them for 10 times the value of what that customer's worth for a once-off cut. Um, and, you know, you can sell it for cheaper, you can sell it for higher, but it's somewhere around that 10, 10 sort of mark. And in, in my mind, I think, you know what, if I did a split, then, you know, what's to say I don't do that customer 12 times, mow their lawn 12 times? I could make more money off of doing it 12 times, or I could do it 20, or I could keep them on for, you know, six or seven years. I could do them 100 times. So for me, it makes more sense. I could make more money long term rather than the short term. It's nice to have an extra 20 grand sitting here from a split that you've just sold, but you could make a hell of a lot of money if you decide to build your business. And that's my opinion. I'm not saying it's right. I've got plenty of franchisees that I know that do splits religiously. Um, but for me, I'd rather bring on employees and, and keep those customers on. Because I can also, from those customers, I can get add-on sales. And I'll touch on that a bit more about these add-on sales because they're very important when you're coming into this business. Um, all right, so I've touched on a little bit about what my mindset was and sort of, sort of my strategy. I'm going to start going into the slides now. So first one is sales building. Um, so as I said, add-on sales, I've put that at the top of the list because it's something that do isn't done enough and it's something that should, should be done more. So I get a lot of my work from, from leads. Um, I'm still get, I still get a lot coming in, um, in, in winter as well. As, as most of you will, because we're with such a reputable, reputable business like gyms, um, everyone's going to call us first. We pretty much, we, we, run, the, uh, we run Australia with the, uh, being the local expert in every single uh, division. So we're always probably going to get the work more than what most other people will. Um, so I, do, I take on a lot of, I take on all leads. I take on all leads I possibly can. But when they do start to die down in winter, there's still a fair few coming through, but when they do start to die down, and I've got five employees where I've got to find 200 hours of labour to fill every single week so that each of my employees can get to 40 hours, I rely on add-on sales. <coughs> and so what I mean by that is when I've got my employees going out and doing jobs for the day, usually we do about 35 to 40 jobs a day um, of, of regulars, and we'll fit in a few once-off jobs here and there. Um, but when they're going up to each of their customers' houses, each of the regulars, what they'll do is when they're getting their brush cutter out and when they're mowing, they'll look around the property and they'll kind of try and see if there's anything that that customer not, might need as an extra. So a garden bed might need to be weeded or the gutters might need to be cleaned or they've got a pile of rubbish that might need to be taken away. And so they're looking at those things. And what I get them to do is I get them to, we've all got a good relationship with our customers, I get them to go up to that customer and ask them if they'd like a quote done on it if they'd like a quote done on that extra little bit of work that we found at their property, um, and the customer will say, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind one of those, because it's, it's no obligation, it's free quote. And then I go out there, and because they've already, they've already set the idea that this is something that needs to be done, I go out there and I quote it, and a lot of the time I'll win it, as long as I've got a reasonable, reasonable price. Um, so that's one way, but it's also, the more regulars that you have on, the more work you'll get from them. They'll always find little jobs like, 
most of your regulars will get gutter cleans once a year or little random things like that. Does anyone have a question at all so far coming into that? It's all pretty stock standard, you're understanding everything I'm saying? Yeah, did you, no? Uh, my, I focus on residential more than commercial. Um, Is that because it's more beneficial to you and quicker and more efficient? Or? Yes, efficient, yep, absolutely. So there's a lot of people that are very successful um, in lawn mowing businesses that build commercially. Yeah. Um, for me, I focus on the residential and it's purely because my business is based on uh, low sales, high volume. Yeah. Um, it's, I like to get in and get out, yeah. exactly. So I have two people um, in, in each team that are going out to do 15 to 20 jobs a day. So as I said, we have two teams going out, we do around 35 to 40 jobs a day. Um, but I'd rather go out and do a quick $65 mow that's gonna take us 15 minutes with two people and then go to do 20 of those, then I would go do a big once-off cleanup. where we, for me, I can, at least the boys can stay in the area that I'm in, so I can always go out there and check on them if I need to, because I'm in that area as well, doing my quotes. Um, and I found that I could do 10 regulars worse, I don't know, let's say 650 bucks, faster than what I can do with one $500 job. And that one $500 job that I do, um, the customer usually has pretty high expectations and usually, because you're not used to dealing with that environment or that, that job, um, things tend to take a little bit longer, um, where when you're doing your regulars, you know the ins and outs of it. You've done it 30, 40 times, you know, so you know it very well, so it's very easy to get in and out, and, and you know what to expect when you get there. With those bigger jobs, you don't, it's not really always the same. So I tend to focus on residentials instead of the commercial stuff. Push mode as opposed to acreage versus residential. Do you do, you do a lot of that as well? Or? I don't do a lot of the uh, acreage, no. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of, uh, mine's residential is like 600 square blocks. Yeah. Um, I do have, I have a couple of write-ons and I'll use them when we, when we need to. So I'm, I'm not saying I don't take on, you know, once-off jobs for doing those write-on jobs or I'll even take them on regularly if I need to. But my, my focus is more about the, uh, the little residential ones. So I've got the write-ons there if I need them. We barely use them though. Yeah. Um, because I find that with a ride-on, so you got to put the ride-on into the back of the trailer, and that, and when you're putting into the, this big ride-on into the back of the trailer, it take up, takes up room and you can't do rubbish jobs. Yeah. Um, now, everything that I'm saying, I know it sounds like a lot of mowing, but I want you to understand that what I'm saying right now, I want you to try and put this into your business. I know we've got different divisions here, so there'll be a way that you guys can connect what I'm saying. So I'm talking about add-on sales from what I've done personally, if you guys are in cleaning, you'll be able to find add-on sales within cleaning. You'll be able to see that there's an oven that really needs to be cleaned badly. Or if you're in dog wash, you'll see that there's you know, paws that need, the, the nails that need to be clipped. So I want you to, even though I'm talking about my experience from mowing, take what I'm saying and try and apply it to your own thing because add-on sales is something that's universal. You can use it in any, any business at all. Um, but yeah, for, for me, um, I use the write-ons when I need to um, because we use, our push mowers that we use are 20 inch decks. So if we use two of those, we've got 40 inch of cutting where a ride on will usually be about 40 inches anyways. Yeah. And so, and you don't have to use up the space of the trailer. Yeah. Um, so that's why I do it. And it works out faster and easier for me and more efficient. And what percentage roughly would you say add on sales adds to your revenue? Um, well look, I would say at the moment, so, at the moment, we're doing about roughly fifteen to seventeen thousand dollars a week um, during winter on sales. Um, I would say that probably about five thousand of that is add-on sales. So if that gives you, I don't know what percentage that is, but that's just rough. So week to week, about that much of, of add-on sales. Um, so up there, you can see I've got marketing. Um, so different marketing strategies I use. So obviously add-on sales is one of those marketing strategies. It's probably my favorite. But another one I use is when I start to get a bit quiet. So I want to talk about when I first started, I bought a business that I had 40, 40 customers in. I bought a, a pre-existing business and I bought the business off the bike. He had 40 customers. Um, I bought it for like, I don't know, 36,000 or something like that, plus GST. Um, and um, I, once I did my regulars in the first couple of days, first two or three days, I was like, what else am I gonna do to fill in time? Because I want to be working seven days a week. So I went out and I got magnets from gyms um, and I put, them on the I put them on these flies 
and I did all these magnet drops in my territory, and I put them in everyone's letterboxes. And I, at the start, I did business cards, but that didn't work as well for me, so I changed it to magnets. Um, and so that, as long as I was working at least eight hours every day, I felt content with what I was doing for the business. So I wanted to try and make sure I was working as much as possible within the business. And it doesn't matter if you're mowing lawns or if you're doing marketing, as long as you're doing something to keep yourself active within the business, instead of just sitting at home, you know, doing, doing nothing. Um, so I was out there, I was dropping off magnets. Um, and then it got to a point where I had already filled up every letterbox in my, in my territory. And then I was like, all right, now what do I do? Because that, that idea is gone. I said, well, actually, maybe I can extend on this a bit. I'm going to speak to my franchisor and see if he's okay with me doing the area next to me, the suburb next to me. Um, and because no one had that territory. So we went to the uh, franchisee meeting and I spoke to them all there and they said they've got no issues with it because no one was close to me at that point. No one was around my area. So I went and did the area next to me as well with, with the approval of my franchisor. Um, so that was, that was one thing that I did with magnets and I've, I've, I've spread them out throughout the suburbs around me with permission. Um, and then I went out and I found real estate agents. And I started speaking to real estate agents. But it wasn't as simple as being like, I'm going to send them an email and ask them if they've got any extra work. Because for them, that's just spam. They're just going to see that, see that email and be like, oh, screw that, I, can't be, I don't have time, they're busy. So I actually personally went in there and I spoke to these real estate agents at their, at their shop fronts. And I went in and I, I tried to find, if I could find a time to speak to the property managers. Um, so I, what I did was I tried to build a bit of a rapport um, and a, a relationship with this property manager, let them know who I am and build my culture, get, show them what my culture was and who I was as a person and what I'm trying to do. And they got, they got excited the same way that I did because they could see that it was someone that genuinely cared about their business and was doing everything they possibly could to push their business. Um, and because of that, they said, you know what, let's give Dan a shot. Let's give him a job here and see how he goes. And when they gave me that job, I would go out and I would smash it out of the park. I would make sure that job was 100% perfect, that very first job. So that, that real estate agent, that uh, property manager, knew what to expect from me. And so because of that, I was able to win a lot more work from them as well. Um, and then, so I, that was the property managers. And then I had support coordinators. Now, does anyone know what a support coordinator is here? Um, so support coordinators, you'll have different insurance companies that you might use um, or that will ask you to do work. So TAC, when people get injured when they're driving a car, they can no longer mow their lawn. So TAC will pay um, someone like Jim's Mowing to go and mow their lawns for them. And so what you do is you find, uh, you find your first uh, support coordinator or case manager and they give you a job and you go and smash it out of the park and you make a good relationship with them and explain to, who, to them who you are and I say, look, you know, I'm Dan Cahill, this is what I'm about, I'm trying to, trying to achieve this, and they become part of your story. And so that after you've set that expectation you've, and you've got that perception, they start to give you more work. And it's like that with all insurance companies as well. So you want to try and make relationships with everyone that you come in contact with. Um, building relationships, just touched on that. Um, so the quoting. Um, the quoting is probably the most challenging thing that I faced, and still probably one of the most challenging things that I faced. Um, so in my first 12 months, I, uh, I quickly learned that there's some people that are a little bit afraid of quoting what they think it's worth. They just kind of want to win the job because they need the money because they need to pay their mortgage. So they'll take on that job for the bottom dollar just so they can get that money coming in. <coughs> and it's very, <coughs> sorry, it's very easy to do that, especially when you're really needing the money. And I nearly got caught in that trap as well. But then I learned that if I quote what my dream price is for that job, so I go into a job and let's say it's a, it's a residential mow. And not, usually independents will quote, quote an, uh, a residential mow that's 600 squares, somewhere around 50 bucks, 60 bucks, somewhere around there. Um, so I would go in with this dream price and I'd go, it's 70. Um, and if they say no, then I can always come down. But I can't go up. If I say 70 and they say yes straight away, I can't go, okay, well I actually meant 80 because no one's going to take it. But if I say 70 and they say, oh, I don't know, it's a bit high, I wasn't expecting it to be that much, well, then I have the option to be like, oh, you know what, well, I can do it for 65 or I can do it for 60. As long as that's, you know, within what, you're, what you think you're worth or what you think the job is worth, um, but you can never go up. So I started quoting what my, what my ideal price was, what I thought I was worth and what I, th what I wanted to get for that job. And I would come down, I had this idea of what 
the minimum price was that I would come down to. And so that, and then I would always have that in the back of my mind, but I would start with that dream price, for, price first of what I thought I was worth, um, and then go from there. But I was able to win these jobs because I was flexible with my price, and I could give the customer another option. So instead of going there and being like, no, that's it, like, and then you walk away and you lose the job, I was able to sort out something with that customer. They, their budget might be $50 instead of the 70 And I could be like, oh, well, look, I can do it for 50 still, but it might mean that I need to mulch mow it instead of catch mow it. So you find little ways to negotiate so you still win that job, as long as it's within reason. Um, there's a bit more that I want to touch on with quoting. Um, so quoting, is, it's, it's very, very challenging um, quoting, and it's really what makes or breaks a lot of businesses. So um, I, could, I could be terrible at mowing lawns, and the next bloke could be great at mowing lawns. He could be a perfectionist and do every single job 100%. But if I'm quoting more and I'm winning the jobs, my business is going to look more successful, even though he, he might be better than me. And if I'm quoting right, that means that I've got the money to put aside to be able to pay employees right as well. I can't have employees on if I'm not quoting the right price. Um, so. I just, I really want to touch on how important it is to get your quoting right. You shouldn't be going out there trying to give everyone mates rates. Um, you, should be, you should be quoting to what the job is worth and then coming down to what you think you're, you're happy to leave with. Um, but don't go any lower than that. Because with gyms, it's a bit different with independence. But with gyms, there's that much work coming through that if you, if you lose that job, there's always a job coming around the corner. So at the moment, I'm a bit higher priced than what most people are. I'm still winning 80% of all my jobs that I quote. Um, and the reason for that is because I come across as a professional and the right person for that job. So people aren't looking for the cheapest price. They wouldn't call gyms if they were looking for the cheapest price because that's not what gym sells. Gyms has never sold the idea of we're the cheapest around. We've always sold the idea of we're the best person for the job and we're convenient. And that's why people come to gyms. So if you're going in there going against the grain and going, oh yeah, I'm going to try and sell it that we're cheap. It, it, it goes against, you could be making a lot more money. So keep in mind, people aren't using us because they think we're cheap, they're using us because we're the right person for the job and that's what you want to sell when you're out there quoting. Um, and efficiency. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't know if, how many of you have figured this out, but we don't quote per hour, we quote per job. <clears throat> and the reason we don't quote per hour is because, let's say I go to a job and it's a residential mode and it's, it's $70 for me to do this residential mode. And I'm able to complete this job in 20 minutes because I've got really good efficiency. Um, or even, let's say half an hour. Let's say half an hour because I've got really good efficiency and because I'm an expert at mowing, I'm an expert at brush cutting, and I get in, I get out, and I do the job right. And then there's another person that comes in and they do the job as well. And they're a bit older than me, they're a bit slower than me, and they don't have the uh, proficiencies that I have on my equipment, and they're not as good as what I am. Um, and they walk slow, um, you know. Where I, when, I'm, when I'm doing jobs, I tend to, I nearly run. That's how, like, I, I want to get in and out. Like, I, when I say in and out, I mean in and out. So I nearly run at all these jobs. I get in there, I brush cut, I mow, I blow, and then I'm out. I get in the car, I drive to my next job. There's no messing around. I don't sit out there writing out an invoice for each job. I email them when I get home later on. I'm trying to save as much time as possible. So I do this job, this $70 job in half an hour. Um, but there's another bloke and he does it in one hour. And the reason he does it in one hour is because he walks half as slow as I do. Um, or when he's getting the gear out of his car, he does it half as slow as I do. It's not, nothing wrong. I'm just a lot faster with how I walk and how I do things. Um, he's sales per, he, what he's earning per hour is $70 for an hour because he's been at a job for an hour that he's getting paid $70 for. We've both done the same job, the quality is exactly the same, except I walked faster, and I did everything a little bit faster. But what I earned for that hour, I did that job in half an hour, I earned $140 an hour. Um, job was done the same. So I want you to understand that the reason that we don't necessarily want to quote per hour is because you might be worth more than what you're worth because you walk, walk twice as fast. So we don't, we don't want to give the idea, because if I go up to a customer and I say, oh yeah, they go, hey Dan, what's your, what's your hourly rate? Oh, it's $140. How many jobs am I going to win? Like, let's be honest, I'm not going to win any. Because they get scared away from it. 
they don't understand that I go in there and I do it twice as fast as anyone, or even you know three times as fast as anyone. All they hear is you're 140 dollars an hour, and they don't know me, and they don't know what I'm worth, and they don't understand how I've decided that I'm worth 140 dollars an hour. So because they don't know me, they're going to be like, oh, I'm going to choose this guy over here who's 50 dollars an hour. He'd be stupid not to, even if he's you know three times as slow as me. But they don't realise I'm going to do a better job. I'm just going to do it faster, and I'm, they're going to get more out of me. So that's why we don't want to say what our uh, price per hour is, and that's why we want to quote per job. Um, so because of the efficiency and because we're able to do that, that's what's going to build our sales a bit more as well. Um, any questions on that at all? Any other questions to do with, with the sales? Keep in mind, I know this is a lot to take in right now. I'm going to be coming and I'll be sitting at the, uh, at the lunch with you guys. I'll be on an open table and if you guys wanted to ask me any questions that you might think of, later on um, with, within the <coughs> class, just come to me and ask me. Because I'm not expecting you guys have questions on the top of your head, but maybe later on you will. All right. Um, so I want to talk a bit more about perception. Um, so as I said, I win about 80% of my jobs. Um, and the reason I'm able to win about 80% of my jobs is because I do the little things that not every other, little, not every other mowing contractor does. So it's, it's all about those little one percenters. I don't know if you've heard that term before, the one percenters. Um, so when I'm dealing with a customer, some customers will try and get the price over the phone because they, wanna, they just want it over and done with. They don't want the awkwardness of you coming out and having to speak face to face. They go, they'll call up and they'll be like, oh, how much is it to mow a lawn? Well, I don't know, I haven't seen the bloody lawn. Like, how am I supposed to know what it is? Um, but I, I find that I can't win as many jobs over the phone is what I can in face to face because people just want the price quickly when, when it's over the phone. And it's a lot easier for someone to say <coughs> no over the phone. There's, you know, there's, no, there's, there's nothing to be scared of. There's, no, there's nothing to worry about. Or, but when you're face to face with them, it's a different story. When you say, hey, your job is $70, it, they, they can't just be like, oh, no, don't worry about it. Like, there has to be some, because there's, there's that human contact, they're going to be nice about it or they're going to, have a think, or maybe you know what? Maybe he's right because he's explained to me how I'm how he's going to do the job. But he's he's told me why it's seventy dollars. Okay, cool. Let's go with it. So I tend to do a lot of my sales, all of my sales, face to face as much as possible. Sometimes I can't um, because that person that wants that job done may not even live in that state. It might be one of their investment properties. Um, so I have to talk to them on the phone. But as as often as I possibly can, I will do it face to face. Um, <clears throat> so, the first impression that these customers get when they, the very first thing they get is they get a trailer driving past them on the road, or they get, they see the 131 number on a billboard, or whatever it is, and then they call gyms, or they hear about it from a family friend, and they've got this impression of gyms that we're, we're not the cheapest, but the best for the job. That's their first impression of gyms. Our job is just to continue with what they're selling. So when they call up the office, they'll talk to the girls in the office, very professional, and the girls will be like, all right, I'll get, in, I'll get you in contact with Dan because Dan's going to be the best man for the job. He'll call you within two hours, um, and, that, and they'll sell it for us. All we've got to do from there on is keep that impression that they've, they've built up for us. We've already got the Jim's brand behind us. We're not starting from the start. We're not independents that have to prove ourselves. We're Jim's. We're united. Everyone knows that gyms is the best, so that's all we've got to do. We've just got to keep that front. Um, so your first impression is they call up the office, very professional. They say Dan's going to call within two hours. As soon as I get that lead come through, within the first five minutes, I call it. Um, because I've been given a two-hour time, but I want to kind of raise their expectations a bit. I want to be like, hey, I've, we've said two hours, but I've really done it in five minutes. So they're, they're getting a bit more uh, trusting of the gym's brand and, and us as franchisees. So I've called him within five minutes and I've tried to build a relationship with this, this customer on the phone a tiny little bit. I'll say a bit of a joke or say something um, while I'm on the phone to them to get, to get them to understand or get them to know who Dan Cahill is a little bit more and what I can do for them. So I've called them up and then what I've done <coughs> is I'm trying to find a time as soon as possible to go out there and quote the job for them. And I'll usually try and get a time on that day or the next. That's me personally, it might not be the same for you guys, but I try and quote them on that very day or the next so that their expectation is a little bit higher and they're a little bit happier with our service. 
Um, so I'll say, yep, look, I can come out there between 2 and 4 today for you. Now, I'm the one that's given them that two-hour time period. No one's told me that I need to give them a two-hour time period when I'm quoting them. I've done that because that's what Jim's does when they, um, when they tell them that the, this franchisee, Dan, is going to call them from the call center. He's going to give you a two-hour time period. So I've, I've copied that, and I've said I'm going to give them two hours as well. Instead of me being like, I'm going to be there at 2 o'clock, it leaves too much room for error because if you get there at 2.05, you're five minutes late. Um, where if I said between 2 and 4, and I get there at 2.05, I'm now 55 minutes early. Um, so it's all about you're in control of what the expectation can be. If you undersell yourself, and then when you go and do it, you give them a better job than what they're expecting, they're, always, they're more likely to use you for that job instead of if you were running five minutes late. So I've told them I'm going to be there between 2 and 4. I get there at 2.05. Um, or two o'clock on the dot. Um, <clears throat> when I'm on my way, so I'll, I'm going to call them when I'm about 10 minutes away. How you going, Joe? Yeah, I'm about 10 minutes away from your property, just thought I'd let you know. Again, I've, I've set that communication, I've set that standard, and they're, they're now expecting me at that time, they're impressed again. Um, I go out there at 205. When I'm walking up to the door, I'm, trying, I'm making sure that my uniform's all nice and clean because I'm representing gyms. Uh, while I'm walking up, I'm going to try and see if there's any add-on sales that I might be able to find on my way to before I get to talk to them. Or I'm going to see if they have a dog, or if they have something special about their yard, something that I can build a relationship with them about. So I'm going to walk up to their property, I'm going to see if they have a little German Shepherd in the backyard, <coughs> and it's barking at me. And when I talk to them, I'm going to be like, oh, Joe, you've got a really good guard dog there, what a beautiful dog. And so I'm building that relationship with them a little bit more, and their impression is, is oh, you know, Dan's a really nice bloke. Um, and so because I'm building this impression with them and I'm, I'm building this relationship with them, they're more likely to, to win, I'm more likely to win that job. So I'll go around and I'll, I'll take a look at what work they need done and I'll explain to them exactly how I'm going to do the job. Nothing's missed. So where, you know, someone else might go in there and be like, oh yeah, I'm going to mow your lawn, no worries, it's $80. I go in there and I go, all right, look, what I'm going to do is this front yard here, I'm going to give you nice straight edges all the way across your footpath. I'm going to cut it at this level so it's going to be a bit of a greeny gold kind of colour. I'm going to use your green bin for the job and then I'm going to blow all, this, all the little bits of scraps into a corner and then I'm going to rake it up and put it into the green bin. I'm telling them every little detail I'm going to do with this job. That way they know what to expect when I do do it and it's able to, they're able to understand they can trust me for this job because I know what I'm doing. I'm not just a bloke that's coming in and saying I'm knowing your lawn for $80. So I've built that impression with them. I've built a relationship with them. I'm going to have a few jokes and a few laughs with them when I do meet them face to face. And I'm going to look like I'm the man for the job and I'm going to sell myself as I'm the man for the job. And because I do that, I win the job. Do you have a different uniform for quoting versus the usual? Uh, no, uh, look, there is a quoting uniform that Jim sells. Personally, me, I, I like to wear the, the high-vis clothes. Um, but I'll always make sure that the high-vis clothes I'm wearing, I always update them to make sure that I've always got a brand new set. Um, and when they do get too old and, you know, they start to, the, the high-vis colour goes a bit faded, I'll throw it in the bin and go get another one. Because the perception is everything when you're trying to sell yourself. If they, if they see someone that rocks up in a uniform that's five years old and it's been in the washing machine, you know, a million times and it's shrunk up a little bit and they can see a little bit of your skin near your belly button, like, what are they going to think? <laughs> so I want to come across as unprofessional, but that, that, and because I wear that gym's uniform, you know, I can see you've got a brand new gym's uniform. Like, how professional does it look? You come up, you they think, geez, he's neat and clean. He must be the right man for the job. Where you know an independent comes up and they've got this tacky old, you know, because they don't think about that that sort of stuff. He's not neat and clean. Dan is. So that's me. Keep spare yeah, exactly. Keep a spare because you're going to get it dirty. Yeah. And you're going to get the brush cutter and you're going to go along the fences and it's going to be that German shepherd that's left that log for you. <laughs> and it's going to spray over you. Leave, leave a spare set in the car. Um, so I'm building the trust with them. And the way I've built that trust is I'm, I'm explaining <coughs> to them, I'm communicating every little thing I'm doing that job. I've told them I'm going to be there in about 10 minutes. I've told them what time I'm going to be there. I've, 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 um, I've raised a bar, I've made their expectation or their impression of the whole Jim's brand. Just from me, they're only dealing with Dan Cahill, but their whole idea of the Jim's brand is a lot more now. 
And because I've done such a good job of building their trust and building the name, they're going to use more divisions. They're going to use Jim's cleaning next. They're going to use Jim's dog wash because Jim's is so good. You should have seen how good they were for us. They did this amazing job. Oh my God, I can't talk highly enough of Jim's. But if they get a bad job from, from one of us, they're not going to use us at all and they're going to tell a million friends how bad we were. So every time I come in, I want to set that expectation of Jim's is the best. That's what I'm doing. Um, we're making the customer a fan. Now, I've, I've stolen that little quote from Jim. I don't know if any of you guys noticed that. I'm, he has a book. He has a book saying that. Um, but it's true. And um, what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm trying to get them to be excited about who I am and what I'm selling. I'm getting them to know who Dan Cahill is. I'm talking to them about my two daughters and my beautiful wife. And I'm telling them about how I'm building this, um, this big business and I'm going for gold. And because of that, they want to see me succeed. They're excited with me. They're on the journey with me. Um, so they become essentially a fan. They, they want to see what you're doing and they want to help you out. Because of that, they're going to say, hey, I've got a friend that needs their lawns mowed. Or they're going to go and tell all their friends about me and then we're going to get more work from it because they want me to succeed, because I've told them about who I am and my story and I've done an amazing job for them. We're making them fans. They're going to help us build build our sales without me doing anything, just because they like me. Um, so that's why it's, it's very, very important to, to essentially to make this customer a fan because they're going to give you more work from themselves and all their friends. And if you want to hear more about it, you can speak to Jim because he will go on and on and on about it. Um, and then maintaining those expectations. What I mean by that is if you've come in and you, you look professional at that first quote, next time you go there, you want to keep that professionalism. You want to build that relationship a bit more. You still want to have a nice, clean uniform. You don't want to drop the bar because otherwise they go, oh, what you did this time wasn't as good as what you did last time. But it's not that at all. It's that their perception has changed. You could have done, you could have mowed their lawn twice as good as what you did it last time. But their perception changes of you because of the uniform you're wearing, because of the way your car looks, because of the, you didn't, you know, uh, I don't know, say hi to them or whatever it is. So. You want to maintain those expectations to keep that customer happy. Uh, I'm not saying you have to go up there and talk, talk their ear off for 10 minutes. I'm, I'm not saying talk to them at all, but I'm just saying rock up to the job looking like you're still neat and clean. Um, because otherwise, all that hard work that you put in build, getting that customer on as a regular or you know, to win that, that once-off job has all been for nothing because you know, they might just go, I'll go get someone else. Any questions on that at all? Any other questions on perception? Yep. Uh, I have a question about the quote, if you don't mind. Yeah, go for it. When you've got a regular that you've quoted two years ago and they've accepted it, can yep. you increase their pricing? Absolutely. So the way that I do it, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an idea of how, so it's a regular, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're a regular that I've quoted two, two years ago. I've quoted this person for $60. Um, really good question, by the way. Um, so I've quoted this person for $60 and I realised that you know, as, I, as time went on, or as my quoting got better, it should have been $70. And every time I go out and I do that job, I'm kicking myself a little bit because I'm like, God damn, I could have made an extra $10 every time I went out here. I've done this job 20 times a year. Um, what you do, or what I do, you guys can copy it, is I put on two new regulars. So I'll take on leads or I'll take on add on sales. Or take, whatever way I bring on new regulars, doesn't matter, all the networking you're doing. So I'll find two new regulars. And when I've taken on the two new regulars for the price I want, and I'm not going to make the same mistake twice, where I quote them 60 instead of 70, after I've done that, then I'll go up to that customer and I'll say, look, um, it's coming to that time of year. We need to put your price up. It's going to be 65 or, or 70. You don't really want to go too crazy high, because otherwise they'll go for good. But if you've done a good job every time, they're going to say, oh, what's an extra 10 bucks to visit? Like, he does a good job. I'm not going to find anyone as good as Dan. He always messages me the night before to let me know he's coming out. I'll pay the extra $10. So I put on two new customers first, and then I tell them that their price is going up. And I say, I say it as nice as possible. Um, but if they say no to it, then they're, what they're essentially saying is, Dan, I don't believe you're worth more than $60 for this job. Or I don't believe the job is worth more than that. And that's fine. But it just means you've got to then come to a decision if you believe you, it is worth more, or if you are worth more. And so I will usually say, okay, well, look, I understand that. Look, I'm really sorry, but moving forward, I'm not going to be able to continue to mow your lawns. Because I've already built two new regulars on. I've already moved the, the business up even more. I've built it. So losing that one customer, yes, it sucks. But I've, I've got little succession plans in place. We're still moving forward. 
We're not staying behind, because otherwise if I decide that, you know, maybe that job is, is worth it or I can deal with that, what's to say I don't go and quote the next job that same price? Because the more, you know, it may not be one customer. It, it may be half your customer base. And you'll say, oh, well, all these customers are that price, so maybe I can just do it for this person because they, if, if, you're not, if you're not changing and adapting, then you'll get stuck behind and you'll end up always quoting lower. So I will build my business and I will tell that customer I'm sorry, but we've got to move on. Um, or they'll say yes, and then it's brilliant, cool. And then what you do is you go and find another customer because they've said yes to your, your price rise to $70. You go find another customer and you ask them the same question. And you say, I'm sorry, but it's come to that time of the year, your prices need to be increased a little bit. And if they say no, no worries, okay, go build another two regulars and then go back to it and do your price rises again. Always make sure that you're building your business before you go out and you know, piss, off, piss off all these customers and you lose half your customer base, build your business up first. Take on two. If you need to say goodbye to one, you, you, you do that, but as, as long as you're building the business. But usually, nine times out of 10, that customer will accept that price rise. That's what I found anyways. So does that help you out at all? Cool. Any other questions? Yep. I have a question on add-on sales. Yep. So uh, as you say that you gonna you are dropping off that uh, magnet um, business card. Yep. To the to to your territory, how often? Um, so I do it once a year. So once a year. so I do it in winter because I'm usually I'm a bit too busy in spring and summer. Um, but I do it I do it in winter um, because I'm trying to find uh, days to fill in my hours because. I might have run out of work or whatever it is. Um, I want to try and build up my sales from being in spring back. In my first year spring, I think we were doing about $10,000 a week uh, towards the end of it. And if, when we get into winter, it might go down to 7000 I want to try and build up those, um, those sales. So I go out and I do those add-on sales during winter and the, the magnets in everyone's letterboxes. And usually from that, I was able to achieve about an extra $1,000 a week in sales just from magnets alone. That's without any other marketing. That was magnets alone, me doing a territory, thousand dollars an extra a week. Do you do flyers as well? Yeah, I always attach a fly to the magnet so it actually says what we do because the magnet only gives so much information because it's so small. You can only put Dan Cahill, Jim's mowing. Here's my number. Here's my email. That's all it's got on it. So the fly, I always connect it so they know what we're serve, what we do. Because when they see you know Jim's mowing or Jim's cleaning or whatever it is, they might not realise we do gutter cleaning. They may not realise we. You know, clean cobwebs, whatever it is. Um, how about that um, going to the real estate in person? How do you sort out that which company you should go and that can work? Like, in, it's about who you're more mowing, but if I think about carpet cleaning, yes. so how I sort out the companies to go in person and see and how often? Um, how do you sort out, like, frequency is, are you saying? So, yeah, how do you sort out these things? Like, if I go to that company, I talk to the property manager and it might work. So, for carpet cleaning, is that the offices are not the real estate, maybe, or maybe the hospitals? So, yeah, I, I think what you're asking is you're saying, how do I, um, how do I choose if I'm going to do carpet cleaning here or if I do, should offer something else? Yeah, like related to the job and the offices that might work? Yeah, so basically, I don't, I try not to pick and choose. I try and quote as many jobs as I possibly can. So I'm gonna offer as many services and uh, offer as many jobs as I possibly can. Um, and if I'm trying to figure out what, if I should be doing carpet cleaning there, is that, I'm, I'm struggling with what you're saying a little bit, but, but what, I'm, what I'm saying is you wanna try and offer all your services. So it's not just carpet cleaning, you might also do window oh, I don't not window cleaning, but something else in that. Yeah. Um, look, that might be something that I can talk to you a little bit later on and go in a bit detail. Um, but yeah, at the moment, I, I'll, I'll have a think on it. Um, all right. Any other questions with this at all? How often do you inspect the work of your employees? How often do I inspect the work of my employees? So I will go out there and I will pop in and see each team at least once a day. Um, and I'll pop in and check that they're doing the jobs right. 
I have constant communication with, that cu with those customers, so I'll message them the night before, um, and I'll always let them know that we have a guarantee where if they're not happy with the work that's being done, I will personally come out and I will, do, I will fix that job myself. So that's the guarantee I put out there, but I will go out, I tend to go out to most of my customers, well, because I'm getting so many out on sales, I could pro I go out there probably every like three weeks or four weeks or something like that. So each job I, that they do, I'm usually out there once a month looking at it anyways. Um, but the customer, if the job's not done to that expectation, because I've set that expectation at the start, if the customer feels that that expectation isn't being hit, they will always call me. So usually I don't have to go out there and follow up on all the 20 jobs they did that day um, because the customer will come to me straight away. And it's better that they come to you instead of calling Jim's because otherwise you get a complaint against your name. Um, and plus, if they come to you, it means they trust you. And, and when they're not coming to you and they're going straight to Jim's, there's something wrong because they don't trust you and they don't think you're going to fix the job so you haven't sold yourself in a certain way that you should have. So um, I don't usually get complaints. I can't even remember the last time I got a complaint. Um, but yeah, all my customers will come to me if the, if the boys have done something they shouldn't have done or you know, they've missed blowing one area. Which, you know, mistakes happen, um, and that's fair enough, but I will always go out and fix it that day for the customer anyways. Um, all right. Um, what time is it? Cool. All right, so motivation. Um, now, everything, everything that I'm talking about right now will mean nothing if you guys don't put it into action um, and if you guys aren't motivated to do it either. So um, why I think motivation is so important is... Um, when you're working flat out seven days a week, like I was in my first 12 months, I'm not, not thinking any of, you know, I don't even think maybe half of you guys won't work seven days a week. Um, but it's hard to keep motivated because you get so tired and so drained. So you've got to find new ways to motivate yourself um, within, within your business. For me, my main motivation at the start was money, and I wanted to try and break my records. And when I say break my records, I made 3,650 that first week. The next week I wanted to do better than that. And then I got to a point where I made $4,000 in one week. And then I said, okay, now that I've made 4,000, I want to try and make 4,500. I got to that point, I wanted to make 5,000. In my first, first year, I was doing $10,000 weeks. Um, so, no, no, $5,000 weeks by myself. Uh, I brought on my brother as an employee six months in to help me get towards that $10,000. Yeah, there's no way I could have done 10,000 by myself. <laughs> Um, 5,000 I could do, still a bit of a stretch. I had to work seven days a week for it. Um, but um, yeah, so that was what motivated me, breaking these records and trying to get to that over $300,000 in that first year. I was, I was motivated to do it. When I seen what I had already achieved about nine months in or so, I was like, hey, if I keep going and I just push it a tiny bit more every week, I'll get to that 300,000. So that was my motivation. So can I ask, at 5,000 a week by yep. yourself, what, how many jobs a day is that roughly? So, there's different types of jobs. Um, look, I can't, what, what's the maths on that? Probably like $800 a day or something like that? Um, seven days a week? Um, $700 a day. Pardon? $700 a day. $700 a day, yeah. cool. Um, so, how many jobs was I doing? Well, most of my jobs uh, are between, around $65 to $70. Um, so, I would do probably about 12 jobs, but I also had insurance jobs where I was charging a little bit more as well, or I also had once-off jobs as well in there. So I didn't finish working until I had all my jobs done, but my, what my trick was, was I wouldn't come home until I had made $800 in that day. So I'd start the day, and let's say I did all my work, and there wasn't $800 worth of work on, let's say there was $600, um, and it was 3 o'clock, I would take work from the next day and put it on to that, that day that I was working, and I'd work until 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So I'd work an extra three hours and do jobs for the next day. And then from the next day, I'd build up that day again, and I'd take work from Wednesday and put it onto Tuesday so I could build it up to that $800 again. And then if I finish that day at three o'clock again or four o'clock, take work from the next day again. And that's where I realized, hey, if I'm gonna keep doing this, I need to really build these sales because I'm gonna keep on running out of work. So I was constantly trying to make sure that I worked from seven to like five or six o'clock at night, every night. So when you were ringing clients and look, I'm free this afternoon, do you want me to do your launch? Absolutely, okay. yep. Because customers don't mind if you're running early, or if you're going to do their place early. They don't like it if you're going to be late. So, I'm curious to know, you talk about your, we're talking about motivation. I'm curious to know, you know, you get up every morning, you're doing this seven days a week, and you know you've done your first lawn mm -hmm. in the morning, and you've got, whatever it is, 12 to go, 10 to go. Yep. 
what kept you what kept you going every day, day after day? Um, so as I said, it wasn't the money. The money wasn't like the money wasn't really what drove me because I got to the point where I was nine months in and I had plenty of money. I paid I paid my mortgage ahead of time and I had savings in the bank and everything. It wasn't the money. It was the idea of what can I achieve. I was excited to see what the challenge was for me. What 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 could stop me? That was my thing. So because money will only motivate you for so long. Once you've once you've got enough money, it's like well, what's going to motivate you next? So mine was the challenge of what could I achieve. So that's what kept me through that first 12 months. My motivation now has changed again. Um, my, my motivation now is to make sure that my employees are set up and they're doing well and they have enough hours for the week and they're able to put food on their table. So I want to try and achieve 40 hours a week for each employee. So bringing on employees, was the motivation for that to make more money or because you were physically um, and you could see that you couldn't maintain it. Yeah, absolutely. So I realised that not. I realised that I was really good at doing the quoting, and I was really good at doing the sales building. Anyone can mow a lawn. I can train anyone to do that. It's very hard to teach someone how to quote right and how to build a business. Very, very difficult. Um, so I realised that only I could do that part of the job. Um, but I only had a certain amount of hours in the week where I was able to work. Otherwise, I'd be physically stuffed for the next week. Um, so I was working like 60 hours a week or whatever, um, probably even more. Um, and I was like, all right, if I need to, if I bring on employees, as I said, it wasn't really about the money. I wanted to try and achieve more records and I didn't want to say no to work. So I kept on bringing on as much work as I possibly could. And when I couldn't keep up with that work, that's when I realised it's time to bring on an employee. So if I, was, if I started to get to the point where I'd turn off my leads, um, uh, I'll get to you in one moment. Uh, if I realised that I, I was turning off my leads, then I was like, all right, I've turned off my leads, which means I'm saying no to money. I'm saying no to building my business bigger than what it could be potentially. I need to bring on an employee. For me, it was achieving you know, the challenges that I set for myself. Yeah. So if that gives you a bit of an idea, what was your question? How, much, how, like, how do you know how much to pay your employee and all that? Like, how how do you say it again? How do you know how much to like, pay your employee? Like, how, how do I know how much to pay, pay, pay my employee? Yeah, like how much you know... like. Is it like a base, all right? There is a base rate, much. absolutely. Yeah. So, you so, just go that off like, is so it the, of what you reckon? Does that make sense? So the, what the base rate is, I don't want to pay that. I want to pay more. And the reason I want to pay more is because I'll actually, I'll, top, I'll, I'll jump into that in a second, but basically the better you treat your staff, and you guys would know this from working at different jobs yourselves, the better you treat your staff, the harder they will work. If you treat your staff like crap, they won't work for you. They will work half as hard as what they potentially could do. So I pay them well and I treat them well. So I, my employees, I've got two employees right now that I'm paying 60, over $65,000 a year. Plus, that's their base rate plus salary, uh, plus overtime, sorry, plus all their annual, plus all their sick leave. So I pay them well. Um, I pay them better than what I should pay them because I know I'm going to get that back in return and they're going to have a lot more respect for me as well. My whole idea is that if I treat people well, they'll treat me well. And it's worked so far this whole time. That's what my business is built on. Where you guys would have worked in jobs where you had crappy managers and crappy owners and you didn't want to be there and you eventually left and all that money they put towards training you was a waste. And they could have got a lot more out of you had they just paid you a bit more and you know, looked after you a bit more. Had a few more crew outings, had a few more beers, told you they appreciate you. And I learned that I was lucky I learned that young at my last job. Um, and so I made sure that I was never ever going to do that to an employee. So I always make sure I pay them well because they've worked twice as hard. Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, what, what does an employee net you after expenses? Um, I usually, usually they make me around three and a half thousand dollars a week. Um, so for each employee, sometimes four. Um, it, it just depends on how much work I bring on. Um, but that, uh, out of that three and a half to four thousand, I've still got to pay their wages out of that. But that's what I'm expecting sales from each employee. Or that's what it ends up being on an average. So if that, if that gives you a bit of an idea, that's per week. So, um, but yeah, I, I want to make that clear for you though. For those of you that are thinking about bringing on employees, don't screw them over. Make sure you treat them well, make sure you pay them well. And the only way that you're going to be able to pay them well is if you're quoting right. And if you've got all those little things that are going to win you those jobs, and you've got plenty of work coming in, and you're quoting the way that you should be quoting, 
If you're treating them well, they will treat you well. So keep that in mind. Yep. So you're saying we are a new employee that I'm about to take on? Yeah. So uh, what I usually do, uh, I usually put them on, I have a plan in my business. So I have a structure that I have and it's, I've, I've copied mine from a, I found a successful business model that I'd worked in before that I knew better than anyone else or better than most. And you guys have probably worked at successful businesses yourself. Um, and so what, I'm, what I did was I decided hey, I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel and make up how to run a successful business when I've already seen a successful business being ran. So I'm going to copy my business the way that that successful business ran. So that's what I did. Um, and I've got what I call crew people, which is when they first start their crew and they learn how to uh, operate all the equipment. So they become an expert in mowing, brush cutting, blowing, all that kind of stuff. And it'll be different for all the different divisions, but it'll be the same kind of idea. And then I made them crew trainers and they started training the new crew and they started learning different training methods and uh, taking on more leadership. Um, but I, I, when they were crew, I would pay them uh, casually. I wouldn't put them on part-time or full-time straight away because I didn't know if it was going to work out. So I'd pay them casually and I paid them, I think it was around 25 an hour, um, around there, um, until they moved up to uh, until the first three months, and then I would pay them more. And then I would start paying them $27.50 an hour, casually. And then once, once they got to the point where they were worth becoming a crew trainer, because I have, um, we have what I call TMS catch-ups, which is kind of like a mini performance review. Um, I got them to the point where they learnt all their uh, proficiencies on all their equipment. And once they learnt it all, then I was like, all right, you're ready to be a crew trainer now. Now you go part-time, and now you'll get $27.50 an hour. So if that, does that cover your question? Yep. Cool. Um, go on. Being a victim of your success, going out and creating, becoming franchisees themselves. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, uh, it's, uh, I'm proud of it, though. Yeah. I'm very, very proud of it. So um, they, when they've worked for me for so long, they understand what my business structure is, yeah. and then they go, I can go and do this for myself. Um, and that's the issue. You're always going to have that because... Because these businesses that we're doing, they're not overly hard to run. Um, what I do, I make it hard for myself because I want to achieve these amazing results. But most people can go do it. And they see that they can go do it and they can probably do it better than anyone else as well because they've learned from what I've done. So yes, they do eventually go out and get their own mowing businesses. But that's the, that's the, that's the balance you've got to find. You've got to find, hey, here's the reason you want to stay with me instead of doing your own thing. I can give you this. And so what I do is I say, I can pay you well. So I'm paying them $65,000 a year, a couple of them $65,000 a year, which is pretty good for mowing lawns. Yeah. You know, there's no, no, not a lot of responsibility. Um, I can train you on how to become an effective leader. I can teach you how to become an effective manager. And I can teach you how to become a successful business owner. And if you stay with me for long enough, I will show you, and I've got these in, so I've started with crew people. And I have crew trainers, and then I have assistant manager, then I have uh, first assistant manager, and I teach them all the little roles and values about how to run a successful business, starting from the start. So I teach them about the proficiencies, and I teach them about training and leadership, then I teach them about management skills like delegation, and then I teach them about the admin of the business. And once they've done that, if they want to go, they can go, because they've got, they've got, there's not much more that I can teach them. But at least if I explain to them that, then I know I've got them for a little while, and they'll stay with me, and I know that they'll go become successful. And I really do, I get very proud when I see them become successful. Because I can go and find another employee, no worries. I'd rather see them do really well for themselves. Um, so, um, again, you get in, you, you get out what you put in. Um, so if you're going to try and get the, take the easy road, and you're going to wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning, you're going to go and mow five or six jobs a day, you're not going to do very well. You'll still be able to pay your bills and your mortgage, um, but you're not going to be able to really build that business properly. You know, if you do what I did and you get to each job at 6.55 in the morning and you work till 5 or 6 o'clock at night, yes, it's hard. I only had to do it for the 12 months and then it started to become a little bit easier for me after that. Um, but you get a lot more out of it. And your lifestyle will most likely, from what, what's happened to me, it will become a lot better in the long run if you put in the hard yards at the start. 
any, anything, any other questions on this before I go to the next one? Oh, cool. Um, planning. All right, so um, you can read the things up there, but the things that I do for planning, um, I have what's called a pre-shift in the morning. So um, I will, every single morning, I get out of bed at six o'clock and my employees are out the front and they start their, start their pre-shift at 6.30. And their pre-shift can take anywhere from 10 minutes to half an hour, depending on how fast they do it. Um, and we'll go through and we'll, I'll explain to them each job and what's expected for the day and I'll go through their job list. And the night before, I've already done a travel plan. I don't know if you guys know what a travel plan is. It's basically when you know a GPS route to make sure you get from each job the fastest way possible. So I've already done that the night before and it's on the sheet of paper and I'm explaining to them where they're starting and where they're ending and I'll always give them a call throughout the middle of the day. Um, so I'm doing this pre-shift and they collect their equipment. They always take two bits of equi uh, two different pieces of equipment um, with them every day. So what I mean by that is they'll take two brush cutters with them, two mowers, two blowers for each team because if one mower dies and breaks down, I don't want them to come all the way back to the yard to go get another mower. They've already got it with them. And Things happen on jobs all the time where you'll have a pull cord that snaps or whatever it is. So it's always better to be safe than sorry. Um, so they'll always take a spare piece of equipment every single day so that nothing can ever really go, go wrong. Um, I do this pre-shift with them. I get them to get as much line out as possible for their, for their brush cutters and you know, they take their fuel and they take the rake and the hedger and everything else and they're prepared for the day. That's what sets the day, sets the day off and they know what to expect. Um, I've already done the travel plan for myself. I always do the travel plan um, just because I know the best route for the, for the jobs and I still want that control within the, within the business to make sure that everything is gonna run smooth for the day. Where if, if I give them the travel plan, they might be able to do it, but if something goes wrong, I don't know where they are. I don't know what job they're at. Where if something goes wrong at 12 o'clock, I know they're either at this job or that job because I know how long each job should take. Do you do the travel plan every morning? Sort of thing, or are you using other apps? No, you, I do it manually. Uh, if there is an app, I'd love to use it. But <laughs> I literally just sit there and I, I draw out a, I draw out my own map of each suburb, yeah. and then I put put a little dot of where that customer is, and then I. Is, is there anything like that in the plans for gyms online or you know, the gyms job? Sorry, I should say. I'm not sure, but it'd be a good yeah, idea. Really good we might have to speak to Jim about that. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a really good idea because that's something I, as I said, I have 35 to 40 jobs I'm doing every day, and I'm sitting there and I'm making this travel plan every single night. Yeah. So. Um, so after I do my pre-shift and I've done the tra travel plan and I've communicated with the boys throughout the day to make sure they're on track and I've gone out there and I've seen them to make sure they're on, on track, I do a post-shift at the end of the day and the post-shift basically just says if there's any changes with any of the jobs that they've done, if a customer wants something else instead, uh, if they want an extra service done next visit so I can go quote it, if any of the equipment had any problems I can fix it that night. Um, so that's, that's basically my thinking with that. Um, and I'm also doing a business plan as well of um, where do I want my business to be in the next six months. I've always kind of got that plan. So at the moment, one of my goals is I want to try and achieve 500 five-star reviews. Um, I'm nearly there. I think I'm at about 450 now. Um, so I'm, I'm chipping away at it. Um, that's one of my goals. I'd also like to become a franchisor eventually. So that's another goal of mine. So I have, always have a plan in the back of my mind of where I'm heading. Um, so you guys will have business plans that you start off with. I really hope out of this class, after this class today, what you guys get from it is I can expect to earn more than, what, than the $2,000 a week or the $400 a day or whatever it is. I really, really hope that a lot of you guys take that out of this today. Um, I'm here today. Jim asked me to come here to, to tell my story. I could be, if I was working at home on my own business, I could be making a lot more money than what I am right now. The only reason I'm here is to help you guys out. I want to see you guys succeed. I get a lot of phone calls from a lot of franchisees around Australia because the franchisors will give them my number and I have to sit there and tell them the whole story over the phone <laughs> one at a time. Yeah. And I said, hey, it's a lot easier if I can take 120 people all at once. Mm -hmm. I really want to see everyone succeed. That's why I say that if, if any of you guys do succeed and you do do well and you do better than $2,000 a week, please email, it, email me and tell me because that's something I really want to see. Um, so um, you're going to make a business plan and you're going to adapt and change with your business plan because not everything's always going to go how you expected it to. You might expect to do $2,000 a week and you end up doing two and a half, you end up doing three, or you get to the point where you start doing 20. Um, the sky's the limit, it really is. I really want to see you guys succeed. 
Um, so I've got a few different planning tools, as I said. Um, I do what's called a TMS catch-up, which is like a mini performance review. It's a bit casual. Um, I know that if I do the casual performance reviews, the, the employees aren't on their toes and they're not, a bit, they're not nervous and they're able to tell me what's going on in their mind a bit more. So basically it's a performance review, but it's casual and um, I, I do it every six months just to make sure that they're all up to date. Um, any other questions on this? Have I, is there anything I've missed? Anything you guys want to talk about? Cool, cool. Um, the culture within my business. So, um, as I said, I like to treat everyone well within my, within my business. I like to pay them well. Um, but I also like to do little things outside of what normal businesses do. So every six months, I'll take them out for a, a, what I call a crew event. So in the middle of the year, we'll do a smaller one. Um, and this year, I just go on about a, two months ago, I took them out paintballing. Yeah. Shoot, shooting it. Yes, <laughs> it was good. Oh yeah, we all ganged up on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one that's uh, ma helping me manage my business, yeah. Shoot the boss, I think they were saying. They didn't shoot me, they knew better than that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I took them out paintballing. Um, they had a blast. Uh, and then after that, I took them out for some drinks, um, uh, some arcade games. Um, and a few of them had a bit more to drink than what they should have, but they had a good night. Um, and then six months before that, I did a Christmas outing. Um, and I, what I did was I, I uh, got a a full floor of an apartment in the city. There's top floor in the city, and um, that was a wild time. So <laughs> Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we were there. Um, well, we brought the beer pong. We brought all the red cups. We played, you wouldn't believe the amount of games. I didn't even know these games existed. Um, and basically, we just, the whole time, we don't even remember what happened. We were going out to clubs. We were going out to bars. We were all having an awesome time. I wanted to get them to enjoy working for us and just say thank you for all the hard work they had done. And I'll do little things like that. Like it's, so I'll always do two, two things a year. I'll do a little thing in the middle of the year and a big thing at the end of the year. They want to go to Gold Coast um, at the end of this year. So I'm going to pay for them to all go to Gold Coast as long as the COVID's all right. Um, but I also, um, every now and then, I'll just say, hey, boys, do you want to come out and watch a movie? So we went last week. I took them out and shouted them all to watch the new Space Jam. Um, and they had a ball for that. I, I paid for everything. Um, just a uh, thank you, or I'll take them out to the pub, or you know, I do little things like that. I want to build that culture. I want to show them how to treat people, and they always work harder for me because they see how much I appreciate what they're doing for me. Um, so I t also teach the culture to my customers, so they see what I do with my employees because my employees tell them, um, and the customers are like, "Geez, Dan treats these people so well." And that's why they, they, they want to stick around. They want to see what else we're doing. They want to see what we're achieving in our business. They become part of the culture. Um, they become part of the journey. And they end up telling all their friends about us as well. So um, I'm built, it's not just the culture of my employees. It's the culture of my customers. It's also it's the culture of my internal customers. So people like the real estate agents or, yeah. You had a question? Um, yeah, do you do like a home scheme with them, like on sales? Uh, no, I definitely should though. Um, someone in the last past three weeks ago said that to me, and yeah, I've, I've spoken to my wife. We're trying to figure something out. I think it's a really good idea because I know that like mechanics and that do it as well. I've heard, yeah. So I think it's a really good idea. They all generally do it without having any reason. Like they don't expect anything in return, so they always try and get as many add-on sales because they have so much respect for me, and they want to see the business grow because they know that if the business grows, they end up growing with it. And the more people I take on, the, big, the more responsibility they can take on. But I think that it would just be an extra nice little thing if I do end up doing something like that. That's actually a really good idea. So. It's good for competition as well. Right? Absolutely. Because yeah. Them a little bit, oh, you, you, you've got one, you're one behind. Go find something else. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's something I'm going to need to take on. Because yeah, I, got that, I got told that the first time three weeks ago. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm definitely going to start doing that. Good idea. Um, You've got to be careful that it's not the same person every time. It has to be, yeah. you, you know. You've you got to find that balance. Yeah. So I everyone so. feels so like I prefer good. this. I prefer this sort of bonus. Yep. Or, yeah. Okay. Just, just slowly give them a, he's a weekend for two. Yep. You know, but don't, don't tell anybody else. Just enjoy what you're doing. All right. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and see how, how, I, how I go about it. And, um, you know, in the next few classes, I might know the answer and I'll be able to tell them all. Um, all right, um, so yeah, I try and keep the crew morale as high as possible. I, you know, 
I, I pay them well, I treat them well. Um, is there any other, uh, like, have you guys worked in businesses where you got treated really well? And you, and you had friends that worked there and you all worked your, your bums off and, you know, the business was able to achieve really good results? And you'd always complain about that guy that doesn't pull his weight. But, yeah, so there you go, yeah. Yeah, oh, you didn't, have, you didn't have that in your last business. Well, yeah, learn from that and, yeah, try, what I would say is learn from that because you're in control of your own business now. It's what you make it. All right, um, here's a few more photos of us getting wild. Um, all right, time to hire, when to hire. All right, um, as I said, when to hire is um, when you can no longer take on any more leads, when you start to turn off those leads because you can't keep up, it's, pretty, it's a pretty good indicator that, hey, here's a red flag you need to hire. But how do you know that you're safe before you hire? How do you know that you're going to be able to afford to keep them on? Just because you, you know, run out of, uh, can't take on leads at one point doesn't mean it's going to happen again. So what I did was I said, all right, I'm going to save up $10,000 um, in a spare savings account before I do anything. I'm going to make sure I pay my mortgage ahead of time, pay all my bills, um, have everything set, all my debts paid off, and then I'm going to put $10,000 in this savings account. And now that I've got that, when I start running out of work, now I'm going to hire. Because at least I've got that, that security behind me where I know I, at least I can pay them um, if anything does go wrong. But because I hired, I was able to take on a lot more sales. I was able to, it's still a risk, but it's, it's what you do. If you, sit on, if you sit on your bum and you don't try and take on any more sales, well, of course <coughs> you're going to fail. But if you make sure that you're out there, you're doing everything you possibly can to market yourself. I went up and I, when I ran out of work, after I'd done the magnets and done all, uh, you know, relationship building, I went out and I'd seen, a, uh, I seen houses that had really long grass. And I went and knocked on their door. And I said, hi, how are you? My name's Dan. I've noticed that your grass might need a cut. A lot of, cut, a lot of them told me to piss off. <laughs> um, but I did win some jobs from it. Um, but I, what I'm trying to get at is, um, I was probably 50-50, told me to piss off, and the other ones, you know, give me a quote. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is I did everything possible to build sales. And so that's what you guys should be doing as well. Um, so, yeah. Uh, who to hire? As I said, I do family and friends. Um, I did try and do the Seek and the Facebook and all that kind of stuff. It didn't work out for me as well as I wanted it because they just didn't have that care. Um, that's not to say it won't be the same with you. I did family and friends, and I also poached people from my last workplace as well. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> so yeah, I stole um, managers that worked at Macca's. Um, so they already had an idea of what I knew about business. And so them coming into my business, it was kind of like, oh, well, this is just McDonald's, except I'm mowing lawns. Yeah, instead of, instead of flipping cheeseburgers, I'm mowing lawns. Um, and how to retain them? Well, you put all this money into training them. Um, they've done an awesome job for you. Treat them well. Pay them well, um, give them bonuses. You know, the add-on sales is a good idea. So, is there anything I haven't covered? You all understand where I'm coming from now and how I'm how I run my business. There's no real questions behind it. Um, and efficiency and time management. All right. So, um, as you can see, I've got up here. I've got my daily checklist, my pre-shift and my post-shift up the top. Um, so that's the things that I expect them to make sure that they've got ready um, before they go to each, each shift. Um, if you want a copy of this, you can either take a photo um, or you can email me and I'll send it through to you. Um, so that's for the pre-shift and the post-shift. Post-shift is based a lot around communication, um, where the pre-shift is making sure, oh, it's communication as well, but it's making sure you have everything ready for the day and your equipment's up and running and you have all the materials you need. Um, and then I have the Dan's daily vehicle requirements so that it makes it easy so they know exactly what to put in those vehicles for their pre-shift. Um, so every, every second counts when you're, out on the, when you're out on the job. You want to try and take as much, um, you want to try and save as much time as possible so you can work as many jobs as possible throughout the day. As I said, I email through my invoices because it saves me time throughout the day or I can do another job instead of writing them out at each job because that's daylight that I'm wasting by doing that when I can do that later on at night. So you want to try and save as many seconds as possible. Um, and communication prevents mistakes. It also helps you get those five-star reviews that I'm getting. If I'm communicating with that customer exactly what they're getting, they get what I've told them they're going to get. And if they don't, I go out and I fix it up myself and they, they have that guarantee. But a lot of the time, my employees will actually go a little bit above and beyond for that customer as well. 
to make them feel like they're, you know, they're a bit more special. And I follow up with that customer to make sure that that job was done to their, to their satisfaction. And I always end up getting a five-star review because of it. Um, yeah, does anyone have any questions at all? Can I go back to track? You mentioned mates rates yep. at the beginning. Um, when you're starting out, obviously you want to build you know, a great reputation from the get-go. I've got five colleagues at my office that are waiting for me to start yes. to do their car. Yep. Absolutely. If I under if I underprice it and, and they get their mate sees the car and oh who did that? Yep. I don't want them to say, well, he only charged me this. No, no. Your advice for it. Um it's, talk to them. so communicate them with them what your problem is. So you say I'm only giving you this price because you're a mate, if you are gonna give them mate rates. But a lot of the times if you're gonna give them a standard price, a normal price that they're gonna charge you, if they are a mate, they'll probably they'll just take it anyways. Like, you know, it, and if they're only using you because they want to, they don't think you're worth your time and they want to make you cheaper than what you're actually worth, they're probably not much of a mate in the first place. Um, but I, I think with that, I'm trying to get across the fact that if you're making relationships with, because you'll only do a certain, you know, you've only got a certain amount of mates in the world yeah. and you only do them every now and then. But I don't want you to make relationship with these customers so that they become your mates after five minutes and then go, oh, because I like you now, I'm going to give you mate rates. You need to charge accordingly. You need to charge the right price. Otherwise, you won't get anywhere. Yeah. So that's what I was. That's what I was trying to get out of with that. But yeah, as I said, they're not real mates if they think that you're less worth less than what you're. Yeah. Um, any other questions? All right. No worries. If you do think of anything, I will be at lunch with you guys. I'll have an open table where you can pop up and ask me any questions you might want to at all. If you do succeed, please tell me because this is probably going to be the last time I speak to you guys apart from lunch. So I'd really like to know your stories about what you are doing in the future, and I really do hope that some of you get to the point where you might, you might even do better than I am. So thank you very much, guys. I appreciate you guys having me.